to week four. We're at the point where it's going to be all about the creation of value, the offerings that have value, and our all familiar friend, the marketing mix and its component product. At this point, we're very, very close to the technology analysis being due. And part of what you're being asked to do in that paper will involve the creation of a value offer. So that's what this course, this is what this section of the course is about. It's about telling the story of why someone's going to get benefit or potentially get benefit from engaging with your project this semester. Now, as with all the aspects of the marketing mix, the product itself is a theory, it's an idea, and it's from our perspective. It's an outward looking, what can we offer to the market? The market then takes that and co-creates the value and finds their use or their mechanism. But we are the ones who have the control over the product itself. And we are the ones who create the conditions that make that initial value offer. So we're going to run a couple of classic product theories and we're going to talk about co-creation of value and we're going to talk about how this all meshes together. The first recap, rehash, is your old friend from Intro to Marketing. Core customer value is controlled by the customer. We don't create that. We create the actual product, uh, the brand name, the value offer, the com all the composition of the product. We put that into the market space and the customer derives value from it in conjunction with their own contributions through co-creation. Where a lot of marketers and marketing students encounter a challenge is that they'll think our oh, core customer value, uh, I get to say what that is, or you'll pitch it as a feature rather than as a set of benefits. So it's the other thing to be very mindful of is that it is in fact a subjective, co-created, determined by the customer, which is why segmentation is your best friend. It will help you understand the kind of person, the kind of customer who would have a core value that your actual product could meet. Now, co-creation, we've talked about it a bit. We're going to talk about it a lot. First of all, there's the principle of services dominant logic, Vargo and Luge 2004. So it's uh, about two decades now. When it first came onto the scene, it was quite controversial, but it's now an accepted part of the business. And the idea here is that there is no object with an inherent merit, an inherent value. Value comes from the use, value comes from what you do with or how you use the product. So you create your side of the value offer in conjunction with the product that's been put into the market by a company or a producer. Ultimately though, what this means for us as marketers is a couple of things. We cannot assume inherent merit. We cannot assume that something we've made has an inherent value. And we must also be mindful that because the customer is involved, we then have to facilitate their access to the value, hence why it's an offering rather than a value. The one thing this paper did is it found the two words with one letter difference and made them the core of their idea. The operant value and the operand value. Because why have simplicity when you can have complexity? Operant resources are the skills that you need to unlock, to enable you to access the value that you're going to co-create. In the course of this subject, operant resources are something that I've been focusing on. The end of video Here's a theoretical paper. Here's how to use that paper to derive value from it. That's training up your operant resources in terms of your skill at using the literature. 
You'll also have operand resources within the subject, which are all the content like this video, the learning management materials, the mere existence of Google Scholar. So functionally, in terms of co-creating your experience in the subject, you have an element of operant, who you are, what skills you bring to it, what practice and training you acquire, you do during the subject. And you use those skills, you use your abilities to act upon the operand resources, which are both the assessment tasks or the resources on what all and this ongoing project. So there's a very strong co-creation of value element to how we design this course and what we do with the course. And also as part of that, the in terms of linking straight back to your content, the operant behavior is something we're trying to enhance. So we're also thinking about the CIVA access element and the operand resources also include the participation and engagement exercise, which is 20 points worth of motivation to get in there and train and practice. So we did have this in mind. Um, and it's week four, the opportunity to co-create value for yourself with the subject is at one of its peak points, because as you design your project for the semester through the e-technology analysis, you are setting up a way in which you can get value from the assessment task and its connected activities. So operant, skills, knowledge, intangible resources. That's also then going to translate over into what are your operant resources for engaging with this project, your project for the ETA. Now the other place of co-creation value where the theory kicks into gear is the idea of innovation, of co-creation through innovative process where, and it has occurred within this subject, you have brought ideas back to me, I have modified elements, we have created content, we've improved the overall value offer through conversation, through engagement. Inside the services dominant literature, the co-creation and innovation pairs up with a few other ideas that are worth exploring. And this is when we start talking about the different forms of value as well. We'll have multiple forms and we will explore them but one of the central ideas in here, and uh, the Ballantyne and Very paper has been very influential in the way I see value creation. There are, their view is there are three ways you can get value out of a, an offer, out of a transaction. And one of those is around, if you have prior expertise with the product, refreshing that expertise. So when you play through a game again, or when you cook a meal that you've cooked before, when you do something you've done previously, you are improving your ability to access the value, but you're also getting more value out this time around. The next place where they have this element is the idea, and it ties into the SIVA model around the information, of the communication. Things like the branding, the reputation, the messaging, the positioning, creates a form of value through consumption. And lastly, the value of an ongoing relationship. The more commitment you have inside a relationship, the less transactional it is, the more value you're going to get out of the value offer, but also of the continued engagement. This three-part framework is also underpinning a chunk of our assessment items, particularly the idea that we would create something around participation and engagement that allow for knowledge renewal and relationship development. And that knowledge renewal is also something when you look at the first three weeks worth of content, how we drew upon things you already know to help you renew that knowledge in the context of e-marketing. Now let's talk value. First up on the list is value and use. This is 
from the experience of the 2020 cohort in their ePortfolios, this was one of the areas where people had light bulb moments of going, oh, this, this explains a lot about my experience, my personal connection with this subject. So the idea of value and use is that there is only value to be gained when the product or the value offer is in the process of being consumed and that you as a consumer are engaging in the use of your skills, hence the operant resources, onto the operand resources provided by the product. So case in point, again for the course, there are all these PDF files and readings attached to it. Downloading them, saving them to the hard drive doesn't do anything. What does something is sitting down, reading through, and then applying. So the reading of the PowerPoint, the reading of the PDF file, creates the operand resources, which you then apply into your assignment through your operant resources. And functionally, if you ain't using it, you're losing it. That said, that said, there is a value that can be acquired through mere possession, through ownership. There are a couple of different ways in which this value is created. One of those is uncertainty reduction. So it's the reduction of perceived risk. It's the idea that the ownership of an object provides comfort and certainty even if you're not using it, you know you've got it if you need it. Uh, there's a lot of stockpiling behavior around this. It's the basis of redundancy systems. I do, as I record a lot of material and I do a lot of work with online delivery, I have a number of cameras. So I have a redundancy. I only use one at a time but the others are, have their value in their ownership of, if I need them, I've got them. I could move to a just-in-time production, but I'm most likely to break a camera when Officeworks is closed. History and track record shows it. The other thing about the value and ownership is that it does form the basis of aspects such as collections, mere possession to deny a competitor to, not, to deny someone else the ownership of a rare object. Uh, only one of the one in 1,000 produced items. The scarcity brings value to the ownership. So there are different ways. You don't have to be using something to be getting value from it, but the value in use is a stronger set of value than the value in ownership. There is also value in exchange. Uh, this is the transactional nature. Uh, this is basically where you were to take a value in ownership item and convert it uh, to a value in exchange by selling it. So merely owning something to deny it to someone else versus buying things to then on sell them. So functionally here, the value is a temporary storage. It's a transitory intermediate stage. It explains things like the Depop or eBay or Etsy where you've created an object with the intention to sell the object. It has a value embedded in it at the present which you realize through the transaction. Now let's play in a new area. Value and prosumption. This is something that I was looking at and it's a dynamically continuous innovation in terms of theory because we have value and use which is a consumption behavior we have prosumption which is a consumption behavior it's a production and consumption intersect so we have a little Venn diagram overlap here where value comes from the consumption of an object for the benefit of others if you think about and you then use your operant operant skills to unlock something of value for an audience. Now this can be a, a YouTube video on unboxing. This can be a makeup review. This can be a lecturer telling you 
about theories that they've read about in papers that they've consumed for the purpose of explaining those concepts to you. The, pri the primary value doesn't come from my consumption or my use of it. It comes from my use of it in a specific context. I am creating content, creating something for another. It's non-transactional in that I retain the original element, the original idea, but I expressly engage in this activity so that what I create is consumed it's a, as an offering that has value by somebody else. In terms of uh, thinking yourself, thinking your way through a value proposition, there are a few different ways in which you can look at it, but functionally what you're looking at here is you are not doing this in isolation. Now the value of this particular model is to remind you that there is competition and competition is good and that there is an overlap between what you provide and what your competitors provide but there is also an element where there's differentiation they do something you don't, you do something they don't it's about making nuance and complexity a feature of the value concept so instead of thinking of it as an isolated I offer my value to the market. It's my value offer sits and resides within a market in the context of its position, segmentation, diagram positioning, its position to my competitors and its relative value to my target customers. Now, we're going to do a quick callback to some previous theories. We're bringing the innovation adoption theory back in here. Whenever you offer a new value and you bring a new and novel value to the market, you have the elements of the Rogers 95 five components, relative advantage, compatibility, observability. The thing about operating on the internet is that on a regular daily, almost minute by minute basis, you're creating new content. This video, every one of these videos I have recorded is new content. It can sit in terms of the continuous or it can sit in terms of the dynamically continuous, but it's just still original new content. Now, original old content would be remixing what I did last year. How it, however it pans out, your connection to the internet also means that you are going to be provisioning novelty into the internet. And there's a couple of areas where it's worth being aware of that is, is your value offer something for your project, for your what you're thinking about with your ETA, is it something that can be tried, tested out, see, tested for fit with the market by the market? Can they come back to this and go, Hmm, does this fit? Does this this does this work for me, or is it something where they have to commit first, then discover? Because then that's going to open up things around the five types of risks. Interweave, interconnect, and interrelate. You are always marketing is cyclical. You're always wanting to look to see what do you know already that can inform your next decision. Now, the other thing to understand about a value offer is that the relative advantage is a moving target. When you release a super new idea into the marketplace, the innovators are, they are there for it. Two and a half percent of the market is just like, oh yeah, it's new, let's try this. The early adopters pretty much are just cribbing their notes off the innovators because that's what they're designed to do. They review what the innovators are up to and go that would set me apart that would make me a leader amongst the people who are following me that is worth my time to adopt and that's how you go from innovators who will try anything twice to early adopters who want to try to bring something in that makes them stand out gives them a reason 
to be followed, gives them a voice. And here's the kicker. The early majority wants to follow and mimic and adapt themselves to what the early adopter is doing. The early adopter needs to keep a constant distance from their early majority to maintain that leadership. So you have the innovators well out in the front of the pack doing their innovation thing. Early adopters filtering it through going, oh, that's an idea worth that's worth trying, that's worth using, I'll take that, I'll skip that, skip that, take that. They, as early adopters, engage this, which then creates the market influence for the early majority, who in turn influence the late majority. And the late majority is like, oh, for God's sake, all right. Everyone else is doing it, I may as well. Tragically, I think this is the reason why the algorithms are showing you dead content and out-of-date content rather than linear timelines. I believe that someone somewhere came to the conclusion that what the public wanted was not real-time updates. They wanted endorsed content that was a little bit old and therefore safer to engage with. And I think it's a mis I think that's the core fundamental reason why we're getting nonlinear timelines in the social media packages, as those social media packages pick up early majority and late majority. I my position is that as an innovator and a consumer, I'm a high twitch, fast reaction, give me the newest thing, you know, refresh the timeline on Twitter, love the linearity of Tumblr really frustrated by Facebook's nonlinear. I'm an innovator. At best, I'm an innovator to early adopter. I don't understand the necessarily understand the needs of the early majority or the late majority. So what I find frustrating might be of benefit to them. And this is why segmentation also exists, is that feature may not be for me. Now my frustration is that it's very easy to retain multiple features you could have the time the linear and the nonlinear timeline available side by side so the innovators can switch on to show me everything new show me nothing more than four hours old early adopters could say show me what the innovators liked early majority could select show me what the early adopters are doing and late majority could be like don't tell me about it until a week after it's happened there's by the way, the laggards, who are a super useful group because they say no and they reject your offer, laggards won't see an advantage. And I'd just like to point out that as someone who is an innovation adoption researcher, I don't use the voice function on Siri because I see no advantage to voice-based searching. Uh, I'm well aware that this is now an older technology. Uh, I don't have a Google at home. I don't use voice-based tools because I don't see an advantage to them. I'm aware of them. I've just rejected them. So I am a laggard in that respect. I was a, quite a laggard on Bluetooth as well. So probably in about 10 years time, I will eventually fall into the talking at my computer to get my computer to do stuff. But I spend a lot of my time talking to my computer to get my computer to record stuff. And if I'm not doing that, I'm usually playing music. So I don't want something that's listening. I want the machine to know when it's needed by me directly interacting with it. Again, I'm a laggard. And laggards are an important part of any given market segmentation by these variables is an ideal type of process. An innovator is a good start for a niche. An early adopter is a good start for a focus campaign. An early majority is the opportunity to break out your ANSOF matrix and go, I now have a market. I will sell more things to this existing market. Late majority can be dealt with by I have a market, that market, 
that I have my early majority is saturated or approaching saturation, I have an existing product, I might as well take it to that new market of late majority. All these theories cross over and interweave and interlap, and it's worth thinking about how to make it work for you. All right, the other thing on the value creation front is co-creation leads to three possible outcomes. And you should see a little something here. Those three outcomes can also mesh back to your zone of tolerance. The first outcome is it met your requirements. You're satisfied. The consequence of which is you'll probably do it again. You go somewhere to eat, the food's great. You go there again. You log into Facebook and it's not a painful experience. You don't want to claw your eyes out. You're probably going to stay logged in. You're not going to delete it. You will find that if you were testing out an idea, so over the course of this semester, one of the aspects I'm interested in you doing in the e-performance review is effectively judging your satisfaction, cognitive dissonance and dissatisfaction with the project plan but also the project platform that you choose in the ETA. Now your second area is cognitive dissonance and this is where you're not sure. You don't know if you're satisfied but you don't know if you're dissatisfied and you've got to think about it and because you're thinking about it your choice is either to try it again or to dismiss it. Say, so, yeah, no, nah, thought it through, no, nah, not happy about that. Um, anyone who's walked away from a TV show several episodes into a season, the cognitive dissonance probably kept you for one or two episodes longer. It'll be like that, yeah, I don't know, I, I, I'll give it one more episode, or I'll give it another episode, or, uh, and anyone who's had to pitch a season to you of, look, first season's a bit of a struggle, but you love it by season two. They went the cognitive dissonance test again into satisfaction. Your other approach is cognitive dissonance or into dissatisfaction or straight dissatisfaction. You log in, you try it out, you poked around with it, it was Neo Cities, and you're like, no, I hate this, I'm never doing this again. And that's okay. That's one of the other things about this project is the reason why we have the ePortfolio is to allow you a chance to document that aspect of the course experience. So say it's uh, down in week seven, I'm getting you to work on an image, audio and videos, week's um, sites. We're going to go play around with a video streaming platform. You test out Vimo and you're like, why? This, no, this is rubbish. You can reject it. Say, no, I don't like this. I prefer YouTube. I'm sticking with YouTube. Dissatisfaction, cease behavior. But you can also look back at it and go, well, what was it? Was it market fit? Was it I didn't get value? Did it lack a relative advantage? Now, we will see this when we come to talk about TikTok a little bit later and the article that's help me understand why TikTok creates cognitive dissonance to dissatisfaction. But functionally, those are your three outcomes. You either like it, try it again, or give it up. Now, I've mentioned Siva a couple of times, and I just want to bring Siva back into play here because Siva is the consumer-focused framework. And what we are wanting you to think about when you are creating a value offer SIVA is a good mental checklist to go through what it is that you are developing as a product to see if it's going to resonate with your audience, to project what are, how am I covering these four aspects so that my audience would find value. The aspect here though is it's also, SIVA is a good framework to go out and talk to potential audiences, to do the entrepreneurship thing of value validation. Product validation, value offer validation, talk to the potential end user. Tell them about what you're offering, see if it's what they want. Two aspects here to think about in terms of the ETA. 
uh, access and information. Within the value offer, what makes a value, what makes an offering that has value into value, if you are relying on customer co-creation, is whether the customer has the skills, the operant resources necessary to co-create the final value element. And if they do, also if they don't, how can you inform them? If you, how can you teach them? How can you give them the knowledge they need to unpack and access the value? So Siva is really useful because Siva can then bring you back into thinking about what does my product design need? What does my value offer require? The holistic, the other thing about Siva, again, when we talked about Siva originally, it is a consumer focused equivalent of a four P's of marketing. It is a marketing mix for consumers, but it's not a clean substitution. So you want to be thinking, again, you want to be using your Siva as a checklist, as a safety net, that as you're pitching together your ETA and you're thinking, all right, I'm going to use this platform for this reason, for this outcome. I'm going to use Wattle to deliver a digital course so that my students can train on the internet whilst learning on the internet, going to university on the internet, so that the internet is an inherent part of this subject. Is it then, is that training and that holistic integration accessible? Yes, if you've got the internet. No, if you don't. But if you don't, then you can't get value out of the course. Um, so that in itself is a market filter. That's a distribution filter. The final thing on Siva is Siva is a good way to start thinking about stakeholders. When you are positioning and when you are promoting a value offer, you will have a market that you don't want and you'll have a market that is an antithesis market, an opposite, an oppositional market. If you are running a community that is all about, it's an online digital community about people who use Instagram and love Instagram, you don't want people who hate Instagram in your community. You don't want people who are in there going, oh, Instagram's stupid, you should use TikTok. They're, they're the wrong audience, so they're an oppositional audience. But if you're to be promoting your Instagram user community by slagging off Twitter and slagging off Facebook, saying, oh, people who use Facebook are stupid, then you're going to aggravate those other users. And you're going to aggravate the people who cross over between Facebook and Instagram, i.e. the owner. So when you're thinking about it, you think about how does the stakeholders, when I'm talking about accessibility, when I'm talking about information, I'm thinking about value, what impact does that also have on my stakeholders and my community at large? All right, uh, I want to bring up a couple of theories in here. This is a setting up a framework for later in semester. Right now, I'm asking you in the ETA to pitch the use of a product pitch the use of a service, pitch the use of something, a technology of some form, to run a project for the duration of semester. When you get to the end of that project and you are starting to write up your e-marketing performance review, you'll notice in the EPR we start talking about the idea of how would you advise someone else to use the product. Lead users and lead user innovation is one of the ways in which we can, as marketers and as business people, we capture novel and unusual uses of our products. I'm a little notorious around the place for lead user innovations when it comes to some of our technology inside Waddle, um, some of our general idea applications. I like, I like using things. Um, I've before now had a number of times where people have been like, I'm pretty certain they didn't design it with you in mind, but also when I start looking at something like very early on in my career, I was told that a particular software package we had couldn't do individual customized uh, student, little self-service student forums. 
Well, I was told that after I was asking how to do it better than I was currently doing it. So I will see things, I will look at things, I'll go, this is how I want to apply it and how I'm going to create value with it. If it's not what the product designer had in mind at commercialization day, it's a lead use innovation. And this is something that if you do find a way, a novel way, and the, a lot of the conducer ways of things in the big, in uh, my big guide to the internet and things you can do with it, conducer based activity is using this in a way that wasn't anticipated. So be aware of this. This theory is going to come back to be valuable for you later. The concept as well uh, is around ideas as much as behaviors. So one of the things that if you are putting together a community-based project, if you are engaging in, say you're running an Instagram account, and you get suggestions from your audience as to the type of content you could cover or the way you could cover things. Uh, now one of my favorite things that exists is the use of video games, multiplayer video games as platforms for interviews. And there's a apocryphal story from the 90s about the early days of Halo online and people going into public service and conducting these conversational interviews by just walking through a Halo server, not playing the game, just using it as a virtual 3D forum and having the people who wanted to see the interview log into that server. So a live performance. It wasn't what the thing was designed to do, but it's what was being used. Now the thing is, when you've got a user base and you've got a customer base, you will often pull back useful information. And this course is no different. There will be stuff. The stuff that's coming to play in 2021 that was suggested to me from students in 2020, and those aspects, those elements, the freely shared innovations, have made it a stronger environment. The feedback gets folded into improve the running conditions. All right, want to uh, talk a little bit at, now, this isn't actually the theory of the week. This is just a side reference to the idea that if you want to know more about the lead users and you want to look at this as a, an element to monitor over the course of your uh, operations and e-marketing, and also if you're the kind of person who your personality-driven uh, aspect, when I started talking about the different ways you can use a platform, you're like, no, I don't want to do that now. I, I want to do something you haven't thought of, Steve. I want to, that, that, that's my plan. This is a good way to get yourself thinking about how you could do that. Uh, it's also useful to look at in terms of things like the whole potential of customization, therefore, Prosumption or conduction allows for, through the lead user concept, through print on demand, mass customization, micro, mass customizations, micro customizations, and the co-production of value. So it's not a theory; it's just valuable. All right, I want to talk about today's paper? This is. All right, I get a little excited about things. This is freaking brilliant, this paper. Uh, absolutely thrilled a bit to find it. Because first of all, I did not know that there was such an intense Instagram activity around pastry chefs. The key, the key idea that I've taken out of this paper, there's two aspects to it. The first one is stakeholder management in product development is really important. And that balancing multiple possible competing stakeholders is a really central idea, particularly in the pastry chef industry. Customers want certain traits in their product. Basically, they're after flavor, size of portion, and value, uh, economic value. You go out to dessert, you got one of the world's best chef, pastry chefs in the restaurant. 
you want something that tastes great, got a bit of bragging rights to it. Oh, oh my God, I got to eat at this restaurant and there's this chef who made this thing. But also you want there to be like, you want it to be decent flavor. You want it to be a good experience. On the other side of the equation, there are the gatekeeper demands of the reviewers, the restaurateurs, the artisans of the pastry chef world who are trying to push the envelope. They're the ones who want to prepare the caviar and black squid ink pastry. They want to take pastry to new levels. They want to take it out of the dessert menu and into the entree. Whereas some of the people just want to, you know, a nice bit of pastry for dessert, you know, something tasty for afters, you know. So there's a couple of theories and ideas that came through that were very interesting. Uh, the notion of open source cooking, this was something that the idea of the secret recipe versus the open source recipe, the proprietary uh, aspect, but also the idea that uh, there's a lot of discussion around creativity. If you are going to work in a project that is going to require, uh, well, that's going to use art or music, you might find this really useful to think about the models of creativity, how creation is influenced by the works of others, and there's a couple of really interesting things in here is that this paper presents a typology of Instagram content. You can take that typology and drive it into another area. So there are three types of content our pastry chefs were making. Content number one is presence. It's to their emphatic social communication tools. Uh, you post to keep the account going and to let people know that you're still there. It's the social media equivalent proof of life. It's also in this class, it, this would be the weekly updates. The live thing of me going, hey, hi, welcome to week three. It's welcome to week four, welcome to week five. Those are the things done live each week. What's interesting in this group is that there are two distinct things. There was the creative ethics, which is citation. This was all about citation and referencing of other creators' works. And if you thought uh, we were big on citation referencing in academia, you have seen nothing until you've seen the throwdown that goes on when one chef fails to cite that they are influenced by another chef. It's on. And the third element is the idea of what this whole paper is based around. It's the proprietary versus the open source but it also raises the question of can you, as an open source chef, reveal the secrets of someone who's inspired you without breaching your code of honor? That's the final fourth idea is that I had no idea that there were codes of honor amongst high cuisine chefs. I didn't know that pastry chefing was an area where you could go into another's kitchen and say, you have besmirched my honor, prepare to duel, and it'd be on over um, whatever pastry chefs make. Uh, I'm not into pastry. So the whole thing, but the typology, what's really interesting here is that you could, in a your own field of expertise, say if you're an athlete, if you're a, uh, engaged in a professional sport, uh, you could, do the presence, showcase uh, your performance at events. You could do the, hi, today I trained with, uh, you know, I've been training with this group and crediting the ethics and crediting the sources. And then you could do, if there was like secret technique, you could dedicate to revealing, to open sourcing the ideas. Now, the one place I have also seen this, now I think about it and talk about this, this describes some of the content you'll see in the parkour community, you know, showing tricking, showing themselves doing stuff, acknowledging in their videos, I'm doing this move because I saw so-and-so on Instagram. And I, so the Storo squad going saying, 
we're out here in um, Vauxhall today because we saw the Motus boys work this arena and we want to try it. The Motus squad's going out to an area in London saying, well, we saw, uh, we've seen Sasha do a 360 pre of this area and we want to try it for ourselves and incorporate it into our work. And then you have them, so that's the creative ethics, that's the acknowledging each other's influences. I'm here doing this move because I've seen another do it. And then when they start talking about how the move is done, unpacking how to, their decisions, their processes, and doing training videos, doing explaining videos. So this content, you know, I've seen it in other areas, not just in uh, hand to flan combat in the pastry division. So that's product, the AKA value offer. Connect across the usual platforms, find me on a social, send me an email, plug in through the Waddle site if you want to face-to-face, uh, face-to-screen -face, face chat, screen-to-screen work. Because this week it's all about finding the way to communicate, but also to create. This is your CIM Satisfy, it's your AMAs Create. It's your offering that has value. And what you need to do with the content this week is put it into value and use, make it work for you, apply it to your own projects, apply it to your own product development, but also think about how these theories can inform how you can get the maximum out of your semester in all four subjects you're studying. Not just for me. Value and use doesn't just stop in my subject. So. With that in mind, it is and has been an honour. It's also time to sign off. I will see you in episode five.